Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kings Mountain National Military Park. We're glad you guys could join us for our 234th anniversary weekend. We've got the new Jersey Light crew that are going to be doing a demonstration for you. Red. During Red. the demonstration, if you'll stay seated on the benches or standing behind, these weapons are loud when they're getting ready to fire. If you don't like loud noises, you can just cover your ears. How are y'all doing this morning? Good, how are you? Good. You don't sound very enthused. <laughs> are you warm enough? Yep. Sure slept there last night. Ooh, absolutely warm. Is that what it got down to? Wow. Hear that? 35 last night. Yeah, 34 would have been cold. Yeah, 34 would have been cold, that's right. <laughs> Boy, they're all spread out. I'm glad you could make it today. We've had glorious weather for this weekend. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're here for is a musket demonstration, so I want to talk a little bit about the musket. Muskets in this time period in the Revolutionary War were typically classified as flintlocks. Okay? A flintlock. How many Boy Scouts, former Boy Scouts, do we have here? Anybody? All right. Oh, good, good, good. So you all know how to start a fire with flint and steel. It's the exact same principle as flint and steel. In the jaws of the hammer, we have a piece of flint. And then the steel is what is known as the frizzen. Okay? Now, you can see a little spoon-shaped piece right down in here. That's called the pan. The pan is where the soldiers, when I give them the command to prime and load, They'll bite the cartridge and dump a little bit of powder in the pan. Now, the frizzin is spring-loaded, so it stays shut, so they can be loaded and the powder won't fall out. They'll then put the rest of the powder down the barrel, stuff the ball down the barrel. We won't be using live rounds, and they'll ram it down. This is what a soldier would have done during the war. Now, flint and steel. You might be able to see it, but when they pull the trigger, you get sparks. Is black powder explosive? Mm -hmm. No. Black powder is not classified as a... Well, for shipping purposes it is because it's in a can. Black powder out of the can is not an explosive. It is... It just burns at an incredibly rapid rate. If we were to pile some on the ground and light it, it would just make a big whoosh, but it wouldn't blow up like people think of an explosive. So the powder in the pan goes whoosh. You'll see that. There's a little hole in the back of the pan that goes into the barrel called a touch hole. The powder from the pan goes in through the touch hole, the, the flash, and ignites the powder in the barrel. The powder, as I said, burns at an incredibly rapid rate, and it produces gas. It's explosive when that gas is contained in the barrel. There's no place for it to go. And so with that rapid burn, that rapid production of gas builds up an amazing amount of pressure very rapidly, and that forces the bullet out of the barrel. Now, this musket, actually a carbine, it's not a musket, is a brown bess. The brown bess, do we have the other bess? This is the musket version, this is the carbine. Different sizes, different uses. The brown bess was the standard weapon of the British Army from late 1720s until the mid 1840s. Very good weapon, 75 caliber. That means the ball that comes out of here is roughly three quarters of an inch in diameter. That's a big piece of lead. Okay. Now, the bess, as I said, was British. It was pin fastened. That means that the barrel is attached to the stock with pins. All right, I'll explain what the significance of that in a second. 63. This is a model 1763 French Charleville. The Charleville differs in the fact that it's 69 caliber as opposed to 75 caliber. Still operates the exact same way. But it, the barrel is held on with bands. Now, the brown bass, wonderful weapon, but a little bit tougher to clean. It's a pain to clean because you have to take all the pins out. You drop a pin on the ground, you have a hard time putting your barrel back on. With the French muskets, all you do, pull the band. And 
now the barrel can come loose from the stock. You pull the three bands, and it comes right off. Bands are held on with springs, and it's ready to go. Now, we also have, <coughs> this is 1757 Spanish musket. The Spanish were allies with the French. How could you tell that by looking at the musket? Barrel band. It's also 69 caliber. Same caliber, barrel bands. This is a, a heavier musket. There's a whole lot more wood in the stock with this musket. Also with the Spanish, the frizzin has got grooves in it. Can you guys see the grooves in the frizzin? Spanish flint, their native flint was not a good flint. So to get a spark equivalent to what you would get with a French amber or a British flint, they had grooves in the frizzin to help generate a better spark. Now, one we don't have, we've got in the unit, we've got a 1740 pot stand. It looks very similar to the brown vest. Pin fastened, 75 caliber. Pot stands were made in the German provinces. Those provinces were allied with the British, hence the Hessians. So their muskets were similarly made, similar caliber. There's another piece that was used. Widowmaker. <laughs> it's called a rifle. Okay. This rifle is 45 caliber, a much smaller diameter ball than the 69 or the 75. The rifle, why is it called a rifle? Who knows weapons? Rifled barrel, right. It has lands and grooves that curl down the barrel and twist so that when the ball comes out, it's like a football spinning, a good forward pass. Much, much, much more accurate than a musket. These muskets at 50 yards, you can hold about a three, four inch group. At 100 yards, you'll hit the target somewhere. Past that, if I was aiming at you, sir, at 100 yards or past 100 yards, you would probably be safe. But she's toast. Okay? Because you have to understand with a smooth bore musket, part of what is going to direct where the ball goes is which part of that barrel it hits last. Because it's going to rattle down that barrel to some degree. The rifle, three, four, five hundred yards, very accurate. But smoothbore musket, well-trained Continental soldiers, militia can fire five shots a minute. That's going through the full prime and the loading procedure five times in a minute. That's better than one round every 15 seconds. A rifle, you're lucky to get two off. The rifle also cannot fix a bayonet. They did have what were known as plug bayonets. They just sort of wedged down in the barrel. But then you lost the ability to do what? Shoot it, unless you want to ruin your ramrod, or excuse me, your bayonet. These, though, who's got one close? This is another 63 Charlieville. When you put the bayonet on the end, it makes a pretty imposing weapon, doesn't it? Many, many battles were dissolved, or not, were, were finalized. Sided is what I was trying to say, with the bayonet. Black powder and humidity or fog or any kind of moisture don't get along. We've done demonstrations, we have tried to do demonstrations on a foggy day, a moist day, and not a single musket will fire. During the war, when that happened, guess what? You decided to battle with the bayonet. They call it cold steel. And that here again was an issue early in the war with the rifles. At the Battle of Long Island, over 600 riflemen were bayoneted by the Hessians. The riflemen didn't have bayonets. They could only load two shots a minute, and the Hessians just ran them down and ran them through. Now, what we're going to do, go through just a few motions of the manual of arms, and then we're going to fire some for you. And as the ranger said, these are loud. Order your firearms. Shoulder your firearms. Trail firearms. We did trails, we came around through the area. That's a good one when you're going through brush and things. Shoulder your firearms. 
poise your firelocks. Shoulder your firelocks. Advance arms. It's another comfortable carry position. Long march. Those muscles weigh nine and a half pounds. Shoulder, fire locks. Prime and load. Watch how they load the muskets. We are not shooting at you. Don't worry. They're fine. They're fine. I've got them out of sync, sort of, because your rear rank is always your tallest rank, so it should be reversed if we were firing in that direction. But since we're firing the other way, they're sort of out of kilter because I'm to the right about. Peace. We're going to fire up here. position you're in now is called second motion secure. That tells me everybody is loaded. Make ready. Take A. Secure. Didn't go off. Secure. Time and See the amount of time it takes them just to dump powder in a pan and just to dump powder down the barrel. They're not stuffing a ball. They're not ramming it down. After each shot, you have more fouling. Every shot gets a little harder to put down. Still, we've got guys here when we do competitions, we can roll four to five shots a minute, live. Make, ready, take aim. You would have used the paper from the cartridge. Most of the time when you have the ball and the cartridge, you've got the paper cartridge, you've got the ball, then you've got your powder, the cartridge would have been dipped in beeswax. So that's your lubricant. You just pour stuff, ran. Make ready. Take aim. High. That Secure fire locks. How many missed fires? I had two. <laughs> To the right of bow. Please. Order your firelocks. We got a little time for some questions. Anybody have any questions so far? You get killed. What happens? Well, it's sort of over. You talking to me? No, you personally. Is someone uh, appointed to, to give commands? The next in command would be the sergeant on the <coughs> end. He would take over from me. If he goes, we've got a corporal. We've got two corporals, one there and one there. They would take over. So it's just a trickle down. Other questions? The use of a 
spontoon. The spontoon goes back to medieval times as a pole arm. The British used it all through the French and Indian War. Sergeants would have carried a halberd. Um, early in the war, Washington ordered that all of his officers carry spontoons and not muskets. This is half our unit. When we're in a reenactment, it makes perfect sense when I'm trying to give commands, if I were trying to prime and load and stay with them, what am I not paying attention to? Them, okay? So by ordering all the officers to carry spontoons, yes, I have a sword, but I've got a pretty good weapon. If they fired and it's going bayonet, I'll take on a musket with this. It's an inch and a half solid oak shaft and a forged blade. It is a sign of rank. It is also a weapon. It enables me to stay somewhat armed to protect myself, yet still put all my attention to my troops. Other questions? No, some militia were, were 